A firefighter adopts three black boys, vowing to reshape their shattered lives. Twenty years later, these brothers orchestrate a surprise that could repay him beyond his wildest dreams. What could possibly repay a lifetime of love and sacrifice? Dive into this heartfelt journey of loyalty, family bonds, and an unforgettable reunion that promises to leave no eye dry. Before we get into the story, comment below where in the world you are watching from today. The fire station's alarm pierced the quiet night. John Carter jumped into his gear, his movements quick and practiced after 15 years as a firefighter. But when the address came through, his heart stopped. No, he whispered. Not Mark's place. The red truck's sirens wailed through the dark streets. John's hands gripped the wheel tight, his knuckles white. As they turned onto Oak Street, orange flames lit up the night sky. Mark Thompson's two-story house was burning. Thompson residence, full engagement. John's voice cracked as he radioed in. The heat hit him like a wall as he jumped out of the truck. Neighbors stood on their lawns in their pajamas, faces glowing in the firelight. John pulled on his mask and tank. He knew this house. He and Mark had spent countless Sunday afternoons watching football in the living room, had shared beers on the back deck, had watched their kids grow up together. Mark, John shouted, though his voice was lost in the roar of flames. He pushed through the front door, ducking under thick black smoke. The stairs to the second floor were still intact, barely. The heat was intense even through his protective gear. Sweat ran down his face as he climbed, testing each step. Mark, Sarah, boys! A crash behind him, part of the roof caving in. John moved faster, checking rooms. The master bedroom was empty. Then he heard it, soft crying coming from the hall closet. Three boys huddled inside pressed against the back wall. Michael, the oldest at 12, had his arms around his younger brothers. Sam, nine, was holding six-year-old Eli, who sobbed into his brother's shirt. Uncle John? Michael's voice was barely a whisper. I've got you, John said, his heart breaking. Come on, one at a time. He scooped up Eli first, shielding the boy's face against his chest as he navigated back through the burning house. After getting him to safety, John rushed back in for Sam, then Michael. Each trip became more dangerous as the fire consumed more of the structure. When all three boys were safe, John went back one last time, desperate to find his friend and Sarah. But the second floor was fully engulfed now. The heat was unbearable, forcing him back. Outside, Paramedics had wrapped the boys in blankets. They sat huddled together in the back of an ambulance, faces streaked with soot and tears. John watched as firefighters finally got the blaze under control, but he already knew. Mark and Sarah were gone. He climbed into the ambulance and sat beside the boys. Eli crawled into his lap, still crying softly. Sam leaned against his arm. Michael just stared straight ahead, his young face too serious. Uncle John? Sam's voice quivered. Mom and Dad aren't coming out, are they? John pulled them closer, his own tears falling now. He had no words to ease their pain. All he could do was hold them as the flames died down and the night grew cold, knowing their lives would never be the same. The morning of the funeral dawned gray and cold. John Carter stood in the cemetery beside the Thompson boys, his black suit feeling too tight around his shoulders. Eli, the youngest, clutched his hand while Sam and Michael stood close on his other side, their faces pale and drawn. People from town filled the rows of chairs, their whispers carrying on the autumn breeze. John caught fragments of their conversations, some supportive, others questioning. Those poor boys. But who will take care of them? Is that firefighter really planning to... Mrs. Henderson from next door dabbed her eyes with a tissue, the grocery store owner, Mr. Patterson, kept shaking his head in disbelief. The boys' teachers sat together, their faces etched with concern. After the service, while people were still milling around offering condolences, Ms. Roberts, the social worker, approached John. Her gray pantsuit matched the overcast sky as she gestured him aside. Mr. Carter, we need to discuss the guardianship papers, she said, her voice gentle but professional. Are you absolutely certain about this decision? 
John watched the boys standing by their parents' graves, more certain than I've been about anything in a long time. They moved to a quiet spot under an oak tree. Ms. Roberts pulled out the documents, explaining each page as John signed. His hand trembled slightly, remembering the last time he'd signed important papers, after his wife Claire's death three years ago. It won't be easy, Ms. Roberts warned. Three boys, especially after such trauma. They're Mark's sons, John said firmly. When Claire died, Mark and Sarah were there for me every day. They brought me dinner, checked on me, made sure I got out of bed. He paused, his throat tight. Mark was more than my best friend. He was my brother in everything but blood. Ms. Roberts nodded, understanding softening her professional demeanor. The initial guardianship will be temporary, with regular check-ins. After six months, we can discuss permanent adoption. John looked at his empty house across from the cemetery. For three years, its silence had echoed with loneliness. Now, perhaps, it could be filled with life again. The boys needed him, and if he was honest with himself, he needed them too. Walking back to the graveside, John gathered the three brothers close. Community members were still nearby, some lingering to hear what would happen to Mark and Sarah's sons. Boys, John said, his voice carrying in the quiet cemetery. I've just signed the papers to become your guardian. If you'll have me, I'd like you to come live with me. Eli's small hand tightened in his. Sam looked up with tear-filled eyes. Michael, serious beyond his years, gave a single, determined nod. The announcement rippled through the gathered crowd. Mrs. Henderson smiled through her tears. Mr. Patterson's doubt seemed to soften. The boys' teachers exchanged relieved glances. John stood tall beside his new family, feeling the weight of Mark and Sarah's presence. He would honor their memory by giving their sons the love and stability they deserved. Together, they would find their way forward. John took his new family home with him, and tried to make them feel comfortable and loved. It was the time of the annual fall festival, when the town square was filled with colorful banners and the smell of kettle corn. John Carter walked through the entrance with his three boys, immediately noticing how conversations hushed as they passed. Eli stayed close to John's side while Sam and Michael walked ahead, trying to appear unbothered by the stairs. Mrs. Peterson, who ran the craft booth, pursed her lips as they approached. John, she said, her voice tight. Quite a change you've made in your life. Just doing what's right, Martha, John replied, keeping his voice steady as he guided Eli toward the pumpkin painting station. Behind them, whispers floated through the autumn air. But they're, you know. Can a single white man really raise three black boys? It's not natural. John felt Eli tense beside him. He squeezed the boy's shoulder gently. Hey, how about we paint that pumpkin? I bet you could make it look amazing. Mr. Wilson, the hardware store owner, approached as Eli settled in with his paints. John, could I have a word? They stepped aside, though John kept the boys in his sight. Mr. Wilson cleared his throat. Look, I respected Mark Thompson, good man, but this uh, taking in his children, people are talking, they're concerned. Concerned about what exactly? John's voice was calm but firm. Well, you know, Eb, it's different. They're different. You're not exactly equipped to handle their unique situation. John straightened his shoulders. Those boys lost their parents, my best friend and his wife. Mark was there for me when Claire died. He was my brother in every way that matters. Those are his sons, and now they're my sons too. More townspeople had gathered within earshot. John continued his voice carrying clearly. I'm not equipped. I'm equipped with love for these boys. I'm equipped with the memory of their father's friendship. I'm equipped with the determination to give them the family they deserve. Sam and Michael had moved closer, standing tall despite the scrutiny. Eli looked up from his pumpkin, paint smeared on his cheek but pride in his eyes as he listened to John defend them. But surely there are other families, someone began. They already have a family, John cut in. Right here. Mrs. Henderson, who had been quiet until now, stepped forward. Well, I think it's wonderful, she declared, loud enough to be heard by everyone. Mark Thompson would be proud to see how you're stepping up for his boys.
John nodded gratefully at her support. Come on, boys, he said, gathering them close. I think we've had enough festival for one day. How about some ice cream instead? At the mention of ice cream, Eli's face lit up. They walked together toward the exit, past the murmuring crowds and questioning looks. John held his head high, and gradually, his boys did too. At the ice cream parlor, away from the festival's tension, John watched as they debated flavors and toppings. You know, he said as they settled into a booth, some people might not understand our family right away, but that doesn't make us any less of one. Michael nodded seriously over his chocolate sundae. Sam smiled slightly, attacking his rocky road. Eli, face already smeared with vanilla ice cream, looked at John with complete trust. The following afternoon, the sun filtered through the dusty attic window as John climbed the creaky stairs, following the sounds of shuffling boxes. He found Eli sitting cross-legged on the floor, carefully examining old photographs he'd discovered in a cardboard box. Found something interesting up here? John asked softly, not wanting to startle the boy. Eli looked up, his eyes bright with curiosity. These are really old, he said, holding up a faded photograph. Is that you? John sat down beside him, taking the photo. That's from my college days. He noticed Eli's attention drift to another box, this one filled with art supplies. The boy's fingers traced the edge of a worn watercolor set. Did you paint? Eli asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Those were Claire's, my late wife's. She loved to paint. John pulled the box closer. Would you like to try them? Eli's eyes widened. Really? You wouldn't mind? Of course not. Claire would have loved knowing they're being used again. John helped Eli gather the supplies, watercolors, brushes, and some slightly yellowed paper. Let's set you up downstairs where there's better light. In the kitchen, John cleared the table and filled a glass with water for the paints. Eli arranged the supplies with careful precision, treating each brush like a precious treasure. His hands moved with natural grace as he began to paint, starting with gentle strokes of blue for the sky. John watched as the house they now shared emerged on the paper, not exactly as it stood, but how Eli saw it. The colors were vibrant and hopeful, warm yellows for the walls, deep greens for the surrounding trees, and splashes of red and purple flowers that didn't exist in reality but somehow felt right. In my old house, Eli said quietly, not looking up from his work, Mom used to hang my drawings on the fridge. His brush hesitated for a moment. Do you think, would it be okay if, this is your home now, John said gently, and that painting deserves more than the fridge. I think it belongs right in the living room, where everyone can see it. Eli added final touches to the painting, small details that made the house come alive. There were three figures playing in the yard, clearly his brothers, and a taller figure standing on the porch that could only be John. When the paint dried, John found a frame that fit perfectly. Together, they hung it in the living room, right where it caught the afternoon light. Eli stood back, studying his work with a mixture of pride and vulnerability. It's beautiful, John said, resting a hand on Eli's shoulder. You have a real gift. Do you think... Eli hesitated, then found his courage. Do you think Mom and Dad would like it? John's heart swelled with emotion. They would love it, Eli, just like I do. The painting became the first piece of their new family story to grace the walls, a bright symbol of hope and new beginnings hanging in their shared home. Sam sat at the kitchen table, his textbooks and papers spread out in neat rows. His pencil moved swiftly across the page as he worked through complex math problems. The afternoon light streamed through the window, illuminating his focused expression. This is incredible, Sam, his science teacher had said earlier that day, holding up his latest test. A perfect score on the advanced chemistry exam. Not many eighth graders could manage that. Sam had ducked his head, pleased but embarrassed by the attention. His classmates had whispered and stared, some with admiration, others with less friendly intent. Later that day in the school hallway, Michael was walking to his next class when he heard familiar voices around the corner. His protective instincts kicked in as he recognized the tone. Trouble was brewing.
Hey, look, it's the genius and the artist, a tall boy sneered, backing Sam and Eli against the lockers. Think you're better than everyone else, don't you? Michael rounded the corner, his presence commanding immediate attention. At 16, he stood tall and strong from years of helping John with yard work and home repairs. Is there a problem here? Michael's voice was calm but firm as he positioned himself between his brothers and the bullies. Just having a friendly chat, the tall boy mumbled, already backing away. Well, chat's over, Michael said. He didn't raise his voice or clench his fists. He didn't need to. His steady gaze and protective stance said everything necessary. After the boys slunk away, John found Michael in the garage working on his bike. Principal Matthews called, John said, pulling up a stool. Told me what happened today. Michael tensed, but John placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder. You handled it exactly right, son. Standing up for your brothers without letting things escalate. That's what family does. That evening, they gathered around the dinner table, the smell of John's lasagna filling the kitchen. Sam couldn't contain his excitement any longer. I got a hundred on my chemistry test, he announced, pulling the paper from his backpack. Mrs. Peterson said it was the highest score she's seen in years. That's wonderful, Sam, John beamed, passing the garlic bread. And Michael, want to tell me about what happened at school today? Michael shrugged, trying to downplay his actions. Some kids were giving Sam and Eli a hard time. I just let them know that wasn't okay. He was awesome, Eli added, his eyes shining with admiration for his older brother. They took one look at him and ran. John looked at his three boys, Sam with his academic achievements, Michael with his protective nature, and Eli with his artistic soul. Pride swelled in his chest. I couldn't be prouder of all of you, John said, his voice thick with emotion. Sam, your dedication to learning is remarkable. And Michael, you showed real strength today, not just in protecting your brothers, but in how you did it. The boys shared glances across the table, their bond stronger than ever. In that moment, they weren't just three brothers who had lost their parents. They were a family, supporting and protecting each other, making their way forward together. The next day, John guided the boys through the aisles of Creative Corner, the local art supply store. Eli's eyes widened at the rows of pristine brushes, vibrant paints, and blank canvases. His fingers traced the edges of a professional-grade easel, hesitating to even dream of owning something so magnificent. Go ahead, John encouraged, placing a gentle hand on Eli's shoulder. Pick out what you need. This is for you. While Eli explored the art supplies with the help of a knowledgeable store clerk, John and Sam moved to the educational section. Sam's face lit up at the sight of advanced textbooks and scientific calculators. Mr. Carter, a woman in her early 30s, approached them, extending her hand. I'm Ms. Roberts, the tutor we spoke about on the phone. I thought I might find you here. John shook her hand warmly. Perfect timing, Sam, this is the tutor I mentioned. She specializes in advanced mathematics and sciences. Ms. Roberts smiled at Sam. Your father tells me you're quite the scholar. I'd be honored to help you prepare for those advanced placement exams. Later that afternoon, John transformed a sunny corner of the living room into Eli's art studio. He carefully arranged the new easel, organizing brushes and paints on a small table beside it. The space felt alive with possibility. In the dining room, Sam sat with Ms. Roberts, diving deep into complex equations. His enthusiasm for learning matched her passionate teaching style perfectly. After Ms. Roberts left, John gathered the boys in the living room. He pulled out an old photograph of his late wife, Sarah, smiling brightly at the camera. Your new supplies and tutoring, John began, his voice soft with memory. They're possible because of Sarah. She left an inheritance, and I know she would have wanted it used this way to help you boys build your futures. Eli stood before his new easel, clutching a sketch pad to his chest. Thank you, he whispered, his eyes glistening. Both of you. Sam nodded in agreement, understanding the weight of this gift. We won't let you down, he promised. John watched as Eli settled into his new workspace, pencil already moving across fresh paper with purpose. The boy's face showed complete concentration, lost in the joy of creating something new. Determined to contribute their share to the household, 
Michael and Sam walked down Main Street. They carried a stack of printed resumes John had helped them prepare the night before. The morning sun cast long shadows as they approached their first stop, Thompson's Grocery. Maybe we should split up, Sam suggested. Cover more ground that way. I Michael nodded, handing half the papers to his brother. Meet back here in two hours? The responses came quickly and consistently. At the grocery store, the manager barely glanced at Michael's resume before saying they weren't hiring. The bookstore owner told Sam they needed someone with more experience. At the auto shop, the mechanic simply shook his head before Michael could even speak. By midday, both brothers sat on a bench outside the diner, sharing a single bottle of water. Maybe we need to change something in the resume, Sam said, studying the paper. Or maybe I should wear a different shirt to interviews. Michael squeezed his brother's shoulder. It's not about the resume or the shirt, Sam, but we'll keep trying. Inside Harrison's hardware store, Michael found Mr. Harrison, a gruff older man, actually reading his resume. You know anything about power tools? My dad, our birth father, taught me the basics, Michael replied. I'm willing to learn more. After a long pause, Mr. Harrison nodded. Monday through Thursday, 4 to 8. Minimum wage. You'll be stocking shelves and helping customers. Meanwhile, Sam had gathered his courage to approach the diner's manager, Mrs. Chen. She watched him bus tables for 15 minutes as a trial run. You're quick on your feet, she observed. We need someone for the afternoon rush, 3 to 7. Think you can handle school and work? Yes, ma'am, Sam answered firmly. I can manage both. That evening, they gathered in the kitchen while John prepared dinner. Michael described the heavy lifting at the hardware store, the endless questions about where items were located, and Mr. Harrison's gruff but patient instructions. My hands are already calloused, Michael said, showing his palms, but I learned how to use the key-cutting machine today. Sam talked about memorizing the menu, learning to balance multiple plates, and dealing with rushed customers during the dinner service. Mrs. Chen says I'm catching on quick, he said proudly, though my feet are killing me. John listened attentively while stirring a pot of chili. I'm proud of both of you, he said. But remember, school comes first, especially for you, Sam. If the work starts affecting your grades, we'll need to reconsider. I've already worked out a study schedule, Sam assured him. I can handle it. And I'll help around the house more, Michael added. Make sure Eli's doing okay, too. John nodded, his eyes reflecting both pride and concern. The jobs will teach you valuable skills, but don't let anyone take advantage of you. If there's any trouble, any at all, you tell me immediately. Both brothers nodded, understanding the deeper meaning behind their adoptive father's words. They knew the challenges they faced weren't just about learning new jobs. They were about proving themselves in a town that didn't always welcome change. Meanwhile, Eli sat at his makeshift art studio in the corner of the living room his paintbrush hovering over the canvas. The afternoon light streamed through the window, illuminating the rich colors he had chosen. Deep purples, warm browns, and vibrant golds that reminded him of the African fabrics his birth mother used to wear. His painting depicted a tree with two distinct root systems, one set reaching deep into soil filled with memories of his birth parents, the other extending toward images of his new life with John and his brothers. The branches above intertwined, creating a canopy of unity and hope. That's really something, Eli, Michael said, pausing on his way to work. He stood behind his younger brother, studying the details. The way you've blended those colors, it's like they're dancing. Sam joined them, his science textbook tucked under his arm. The symbolism is powerful. Look how the roots connect everything together. Eli dabbed more gold paint onto a branch. I wanted to show both parts of who we are, where we came from and where we are now. John walked in carrying a fresh glass of water for Eli's brushes. He placed it carefully beside the easel and stepped back to observe the painting. His eyes grew soft as he took in the meaning behind every brush stroke. Your parents would be proud, John said quietly, both sets of them. Eli worked steadily through the afternoon, adding layers of detail and meaning. His brothers drifted in and out, offering encouragement and suggestions. John helped him select a frame that complemented the artwork without overshadowing it. 
The next morning, John carefully wrapped the painting for transport. Ready for the big day? He asked, helping Eli load it into their truck. At the community center, other contestants and their families were setting up their pieces. Eli's hands shook slightly as he positioned his painting on the designated easel. The judges moved from piece to piece, making notes on their clipboards. When they reached Eli's painting, one judge paused longer than she had at the others. Tell us about your inspiration, she said warmly. <laughs> Eli stood straighter, drawing strength from his family's presence beside him. It's about family, he explained. About how love grows new roots without losing the old ones. About how two different stories can become one. The judge nodded thoughtfully, making additional notes. As the judges deliberated, John bought everyone hot chocolate from the refreshment table. Sam helped Eli adjust the lighting on his painting, while Michael stood protectively nearby, ready to field any questions from curious onlookers. Finally, the head judge stepped up to the microphone. We've seen remarkable talent today, she began, but one piece stood out for its technical skill, emotional depth, and powerful message of unity. First place goes to Eli Thompson. The room erupted in applause. Eli stood frozen until Michael gave him a gentle push forward. As he accepted his ribbon, his hands still trembling, he saw John beaming with pride, tears glistening in his eyes. The award ceremony buzzed with anticipation as families and artists gathered in the community center's main hall. Eli sat between John and his brothers, his fingers fidgeting with the sleeve of his best dress shirt. The head judge approached the podium, tapping the microphone twice. Before we announce our winners, she said, I want to thank all the talented artists who shared their work with us today. Eli's heart pounded as she began announcing the honorable mentions, then third place, then second. John squeezed his shoulder gently. And our first place winner, the judge paused, smiling, demonstrating exceptional talent and emotional depth, Eli Thompson. The room filled with applause. Sam and Michael whooped loudly as Eli made his way to the stage, his legs shaking slightly. The judge handed him an envelope containing the cash prize and a certificate for 10 professional art classes at the local academy. Would you like to say a few words, she asked, gesturing to the microphone. Eli nodded, taking a deep breath. Art helped me find my voice when I didn't have words, he began softly. Through my painting, I could tell the story of two families becoming one. I want to thank my brothers for always believing in me, and John, my dad for giving me the tools to express myself. After the ceremony, several reporters approached with cameras and notepads. Eli, how does it feel to win? One asked, holding out a recorder. Amazing, Eli replied, standing taller with John beside him. I never thought my art could touch so many people. Mr. Carter, another reporter turned to John. What inspired you to support Eli's artistic journey? Every child deserves the chance to shine, John answered, his voice warm with pride. I just helped Eli find his light. Mrs. Peterson, who had once whispered doubts about their family at the grocery store, approached with genuine enthusiasm. Eli, your painting moved me to tears, she said, patting his arm. You have a real gift. Other community members gathered around asking questions about his technique and the story behind his painting. Mr. Thompson from the hardware store where Michael worked even offered to display some of Eli's pieces in his shop window. Back home, they gathered in the living room, the prize envelope and certificate sitting on the coffee table. Things are changing, Sam observed, looking at his brothers. Did you see how many people wanted to learn about your art, Eli? The academy classes start next month, John added, picking up the certificate. Your talent opened more than just doors. It opened people's hearts. Michael grinned, ruffling Eli's hair. Our little brother, the famous artist. They sat together, discussing the possibilities that lay ahead with the Art Academy, sharing a moment of quiet joy in how far they'd come as a family. One fine day the following month, Eli stepped into the Art Academy's sunlit studio, his heart racing with excitement. The room smelled of fresh paint and possibility, with easels arranged in a circle and professional-grade supplies laid out on wooden tables. His instructor, Miss Rivera, welcomed him with a warm smile. Welcome to Advanced Techniques, Eli, she said, gesturing to an empty easel. We're exploring texture and emotion today. Over the next few weeks, Eli absorbed everything he could. 
he learned to layer colors in ways that made them seem to dance on the canvas. His classmates often gathered around his easel, watching in amazement as he brought scenes to life with bold strokes and subtle shading. When the day of the class showcase arrived, Eli carefully arranged his three best pieces against the white gallery wall. The centerpiece was a striking portrait of his family, John reading to him and his brothers on their old worn couch, the warm lights casting gentle shadows that spoke of safety and belonging. Marcus Chen, the visiting artist known for his emotional landscape pieces, moved slowly through the gallery. He stopped at Eli's display, his eyes widening as he took in the details. Who created these? he asked Ms. Rivera. That would be Eli Thompson, she replied, waving Eli over. Mr. Chen studied Eli's work intently. Your use of light and shadow is remarkable, he said, pointing to the family portrait. The emotion here is palpable. How long have you been painting? About two years seriously, Eli answered, his voice steady despite his nervousness. Since my adoptive father got me my first real set of paints, Mr. Chen nodded thoughtfully. I curate a gallery in the city, he said. We have an opening next month for a young artist showcase. Would you be interested in exhibiting your work? Eli's breath caught in his throat. A real gallery? In the city? Your perspective is unique, Mr. Chen explained. Your work speaks to both personal experience and universal themes. That's rare, especially in someone so young. That evening, Eli could barely contain himself as he sat down to dinner with his family. John had made his famous meatloaf, and Sam and Michael were already digging in when Eli cleared his throat. I have some news, he announced, his voice trembling with excitement. What is it, son? John asked, setting down his fork. Mr. Chen, this famous artist who visited our showcase today, he wants me to exhibit my work at his gallery in the city next month. The table erupted in cheers. Michael reached over to give Eli a side hug while Sam grinned proudly. A real gallery exhibition? John's eyes shone with pride. That's incredible, Eli. We'll need to prepare quite a few pieces, Eli said, his mind already racing with ideas, and figure out transportation and... We'll make it happen, John assured him, reaching across to squeeze his hand. Whatever you need. Our brother, the famous artist, Sam teased echoing Michael's words from the competition. They spent the rest of dinner discussing logistics and possibilities, their excitement filling the kitchen with warmth and joy. Eli's heart felt full as he looked around at his family, knowing their support had helped make this moment possible. While Eli remained busy with his art, Sam had opted to volunteer at the local clinic. He adjusted his volunteer badge as he walked through the clinic's sliding doors. The familiar antiseptic smell and quiet bustle of the waiting room made him feel instantly at home. Nurse Martinez waved him over to the front desk. Good morning, Sam. Ready for another exciting day? She asked, handing him a clipboard with patient intake forms. Always ready, Sam replied with enthusiasm. He'd been volunteering at the clinic for three weeks now, and each day brought new learning opportunities. Throughout the morning, Sam assisted the staff with various tasks, he took vital signs, helped organize medical supplies, and provided comfort to nervous patients. His gentle demeanor and careful attention to detail didn't go unnoticed. You have excellent bedside manner, Dr. Williams commented as Sam helped calm an anxious child getting her vaccines. That's something that can't be taught. Around noon, the clinic's usual rhythm was disrupted by a commotion at the entrance. An elderly man stumbled in, clutching his chest and struggling to breathe. Sam quickly grabbed a wheelchair and helped the nurses get him to an examination room. Blood pressure's dropping, Nurse Martinez called out. We need the crash cart. Sam moved with surprising composure, helping the staff as they stabilized the patient. He handed supplies to Dr. Williams and kept track of vital signs, his mind clear despite the tension in the room. After the emergency was handled and the patient transferred to the hospital, Dr. Williams pulled Sam aside. You showed remarkable poise back there, she said. Have you considered cardiology as a specialty? Sam nodded eagerly. Actually, I've been researching it. The way the heart works fascinates me. During his lunch break, Sam pulled out his laptop and continued his research on medical schools. He'd already bookmarked several scholarship opportunities, 
and created a detailed spreadsheet of requirements and deadlines. That evening, back in his room, Sam opened his journal and began to write. Today reinforced everything I love about medicine. Helping that cardiac patient showed me how quick thinking and teamwork can literally save lives. Dr. Williams mentioned cardiology again, and I think she might be right. It could be my calling. The way everyone worked together during the emergency, how each person knew exactly what to do. I want to be part of that. I want to make a difference like that. He paused, tapping his pen thoughtfully against the page before continuing. John asked me yesterday if all these clinic hours on top of school and my diner job might be too much. But honestly, being here energizes me. Every time I help a patient or learn something new, it feels right. This is what I'm meant to do. With his two brothers settled on their individual paths, Michael was fairly content. He sat at the kitchen table late one evening, surrounded by spreadsheets and business magazines. His calculator clicked steadily as he reviewed his savings from his multiple jobs. The hardware store position had grown into more hours, and he'd picked up weekend work mowing lawns for neighbors. Every dollar went straight into his business fund. You're up late again, John said, entering the kitchen for a glass of water. He glanced at Michael's careful notes and detailed financial tracking. Just running the numbers, Michael replied, rubbing his tired eyes. Did you know there are only two professional landscaping companies serving our whole county? At the hardware store the next day, Mr. Jenkins, the owner, noticed Michael studying a book about small business management during his lunch break. Got the entrepreneurial bug, eh? Mr. Jenkins pulled up a chair. You know, I started this store 30 years ago with just a dream and a small loan. Michael straightened up, eager to learn. How did you handle the initial challenges? Planning is everything, Mr. Jenkins explained, sketching a simple business model on a scrap of paper. But so is identifying what people need. I've noticed you've got a good eye for that. Over the next few weeks, Michael gathered information from local business owners. Many were impressed by his methodical approach and willingness to learn. He discovered that while the area had basic lawn care services, no one offered comprehensive landscaping solutions for both homes and businesses. In the evenings, Michael refined his business plan. He calculated startup costs, researched equipment prices, and mapped out potential service areas. His experience mowing lawns had shown him the potential for expansion into full landscaping services. One Sunday afternoon, Michael laid out his completed business plan on the dining room table. John sat down to review it, his expression thoughtful as he turned the pages. You've really done your homework, John said, studying the detailed financial projections. But starting a business is risky. What's your timeline looking like? I've mapped out an 18-month plan, Michael explained, pointing to his schedule. Start small with basic services, reinvest the profits, and gradually expand into full landscaping design and maintenance. John nodded slowly. It's ambitious, but you've thought it through. How about we set some milestone goals before you take the full leap? Together, they outlined a practical timeline that would allow Michael to build his business while maintaining some financial security. The plan would start with Michael keeping his hardware store job while slowly building his client base on weekends. I believe in you, John said, placing a supportive hand on Michael's shoulder. Just remember, slow and steady wins the race. A few days had passed and the Thompson living room had transformed into an impromptu art gallery, with paintings leaning against every wall. Eli stood in the center, biting his lip as he considered each piece. His brothers sat on the couch, offering their perspectives as he held up different works. This one really shows your journey, Sam said, pointing to a vibrant canvas depicting three intertwined trees against a sunset sky. The symbolism is perfect. Michael nodded in agreement. Plus, it's got that emotional punch the gallery owner mentioned they're looking for. John watched from his armchair, pride evident in his eyes as his sons worked together. The exhibition was becoming a family project, with each brother contributing his unique strengths. I've already started mapping out the social media campaign, Sam announced, pulling out his laptop. We should target local art enthusiasts and cultural organizations. His fingers flew across the keyboard as he created an event page, complete with professional descriptions of Eli's work. Michael pulled out his own notebook, 
filled with detailed logistics plans. I spoke with the gallery staff today. They've got a loading dock we can use, and I've arranged for proper transportation of the artwork. He showed Eli the careful schedule he'd created for installation day. The pieces need to be delivered by Thursday morning, Michael continued. I'll rent a climate-controlled van to ensure everything arrives in perfect condition. Sam held up a stack of freshly printed flyers. I've already contacted the local paper and several art critics. The mayor's office confirmed they'll send a representative. As evening approached, the family gathered around the kitchen table, their usual dinner spot. The energy was different tonight. A mixture of excitement and nervous anticipation hung in the air. I never thought I'd have my own exhibition, Eli said quietly, pushing his food around his plate. It feels surreal. You earned this, John assured him, reaching across to squeeze his shoulder. Your talent got you here. We're all in this together, Michael added, his voice firm with conviction. Tomorrow's setup will go smoothly. I've triple-checked everything. Sam looked up from his phone. The online response is already amazing. People are really excited to see your work, Eli. They sat together long after the plates were cleared, sharing their hopes and concerns about the exhibition. The living room lights cast a warm glow as they talked, their voices soft but full of emotion. Remember when you first found those old watercolors in the attic? John asked, smiling at the memory. Feels like a lifetime ago, Eli replied looking around at his family. I wouldn't be here without all of you. The brothers exchanged glances, each remembering their own role in supporting Eli's journey. Their bond, forged through loss and strengthened by love, had never felt stronger than in this moment of anticipation. The gallery buzzed with excitement as elegantly dressed guests filtered through the doors. Eli stood near the entrance, his hands clasped behind his back to hide their slight trembling. John, Michael, and Sam positioned themselves strategically throughout the space, ready to support him while engaging with visitors. The use of color in this piece is extraordinary, remarked Mrs. Henderson, a local art teacher who had previously expressed doubts about the family. She stood before a large canvas depicting three young boys holding hands in a ring of light. The way you've captured the emotion here, Eli? It's remarkable. Eli stepped forward his confidence growing as he explained. This represents the moment we became a real family. The light symbolizes hope and new beginnings. Across the room, Michael overheard Mr. Patterson, a prominent business owner known for his previous skepticism, discussing one of Eli's paintings with other guests. The technical skill is impressive, but it's the story behind it that really gets you, Patterson said gesturing to a piece showing hands of different colors intertwined. This young man has something important to say. Sam expertly guided visitors through the exhibition, his natural intelligence helping him articulate the deeper meanings behind his brother's work. Each piece represents a different stage of our journey, he explained to a group of interested patrons. Marcus Wells, a respected art critic from the city newspaper, spent considerable time studying each painting. His presence had initially made Eli nervous, but as the evening progressed, Wells approached him with genuine enthusiasm. Your work speaks to universal themes while maintaining a deeply personal perspective, Wells said, his notepad filled with observations. I'd like to feature you in my upcoming article about emerging artists. There's also an opportunity for a showcase at the City Art Center I'd like to discuss. John watched proudly as Eli handled each interaction with growing confidence. The transformation was visible, from the nervous young artist at the beginning of the evening to a poised young man discussing his work with authority and passion. Red sold dots began appearing beside several pieces, each sale marking another victory. The gallery owner couldn't hide her pleasure as she updated the sales list, while community members who had once whispered doubts now openly praised both the art and the artist. I never expected such depth. Mrs. Collins, a longtime resident known for her traditional views, admitted to John. Your son has helped me see things differently. As the evening drew to a close, the family gathered near Eli's centerpiece, a large canvas showing a firefighter carrying three children through flames toward light. The painting had drawn the most attention and emotion from visitors throughout the night. You did it, son, John said softly, placing a hand on Eli's shoulder. 
The pride in his voice was matched by the beaming faces of Michael and Sam. The gallery owner approached them, holding a thick stack of business cards and contact information from interested buyers and art professionals. This has been one of our most successful exhibition openings, she announced, her eyes bright with satisfaction. The family stood together, surrounded by Eli's art and the warmth of acceptance from their community. The evening had transformed more than just perceptions of Eli's talent. It had shifted the entire town's view of their unconventional family. The celebratory dinner at Romano's restaurant was in full swing. Plates of pasta and garlic bread covered the table as the family basked in the success of Eli's exhibition. The warm glow of achievement still radiated from their faces when a sharp beeping cut through their conversation. John's pager flashed urgently. His expression shifted instantly from proud father to focused firefighter as he read the alert. Major fire at the Morgan building downtown, I've got to go. But dad, Eli started, but John was already on his feet. Stay here, celebrate, you've earned it, John said, squeezing Eli's shoulder before rushing out. The brothers exchanged glances, their food forgotten. The Morgan building was one of the oldest structures in town, a beautiful brick landmark that had stood for over a century. We should go. Michael said, already standing. Sam and Eli nodded, understanding in their eyes. When they arrived at the scene, flames were already consuming the building's upper floors. Fire trucks lined the street, their red lights painting the gathering crowd in an eerie glow. The brothers stood among the onlookers, watching as their father directed his team with practiced efficiency. The heat was intense even from their position behind the safety line. The crackling of flames and breaking glass brought back memories they'd rather forget. Eli's hand trembled slightly as he watched, and Sam gripped his brother's shoulder in silent support. Through the chaos, they could see John and his team working methodically, fighting back the flames. Water arced through the air as multiple hoses targeted the blaze. For a moment, it seemed they were gaining ground. Then came the sound, a deep, threatening groan from within the building. Several firefighters shouted warnings. John was helping direct a team out of the building when it happened. A massive wooden beam, weakened by the fire, crashed down. The brothers watched in horror as their father disappeared under the falling debris. Time seemed to freeze. Then everything happened at once. Firefighters rushing to John's location, paramedics sprinting forward with equipment, radio calls becoming more urgent. When they finally pulled John out, he was conscious but clearly injured. The brothers pushed through the crowd, reaching the ambulance just as the paramedics were loading him in. Dad, Sam called out, his medical knowledge making him especially aware of potential injuries. I'm okay, John managed through gritted teeth, though the pain in his voice said otherwise. Just a bad hit. Stay together. I'll see you at the hospital. The ambulance doors closed and the vehicle sped away, sirens wailing. The brothers stood in its wake the fire still raging behind them, their celebration forgotten. At the hospital, they huddled in the emergency room waiting area. The stark fluorescent lights and antiseptic smell brought back memories of another night, years ago, when they'd waited for news about their parents. Michael paced while Sam studied every medical professional who passed by, trying to read their expressions. Eli sat perfectly still, his artist's hands clasped tightly in his lap. The minutes stretched endlessly as they waited for news about John's condition. The fear they'd thought long buried resurface with each passing moment. They were no longer successful young men, an artist, a medical student, and a budding entrepreneur. They were three scared boys again, facing the possibility of losing another parent to fire. In the sterile hospital waiting room, Michael resumed his pacing while Sam sat rigid in an uncomfortable plastic chair. Eli had pulled his knees up to his chest, making himself small like he used to do as a child. Remember the first night at John's house? Sam broke the heavy silence. How he stayed up with us because we were too scared to sleep? Michael stopped pacing, a faint smile crossing his worried face. He made us hot chocolate and told us stories about Dad, our birth dad, from when they were kids. And he didn't even like hot chocolate, Eli added softly but he drank it with us anyway. The memory hung between them, warm and comforting in the cold hospital air. Sam leaned forward, elbows on his knees. I was so angry back then, at everything. But John never got mad, 
no matter how much I acted out. He taught me it was okay to cry, Eli shared, his voice barely above a whisper. Said real strength isn't about hiding feelings, but facing them. Michael settled into a chair beside his brothers. What if, he started, then swallowed hard. What if we lose him too? Eh. The question they'd all been avoiding hung heavy in the air. Sam's medical knowledge made him all too aware of the possibilities, but he thought of what John would say. Then we stick together, like he taught us. He always said family isn't about blood, Eli remembered, straightening up. It's about who shows up when things get tough. And who stays, Michael added. Remember when those kids at school were giving us trouble? John didn't just tell us to ignore them. He taught us to stand tall, to be proud of who we are. Sam nodded. He came to every science fair even when he was exhausted from his shifts. Said nothing was more important than being there for family. And my art, Eli said. He didn't just buy me supplies. He learned about art himself, so he could really understand what I was trying to say in my paintings. The brothers fell into a rhythm of sharing memories, each one a testament to John's impact on their lives. They recalled his lessons about perseverance, about dignity in the face of prejudice, about the importance of supporting each other. He taught us that strength isn't just about muscle, Michael reflected. It's about getting back up, about facing your fears. About being there for each other, Sam agreed, like now. A nurse appeared in the doorway, bringing news that John was stable and resting. The brothers exchanged determined looks, silently agreeing to take shifts staying with him through the night. As they stood outside his room, preparing to enter, Eli spoke softly. We're not those scared kids anymore. John made sure of that. No, we're not, Michael agreed, his hand on the door handle. We're Carters now. All of us. And Carters stand together, Sam finished, as they quietly entered the room where their father slept. John's eyes fluttered open to find his three sons gathered around his hospital bed. Eli sat sketching in his notebook, while Sam studied medical charts and Michael dozed in an uncomfortable chair. The steady beeping of monitors filled the quiet room. My boys, John's voice was hoarse but warm. All three heads snapped up immediately. Dad! They spoke almost in unison, moving closer to his bed. How long was I out, John asked, trying to shift position and wincing at the pain. Just overnight, Sam answered, his medical knowledge showing as he checked the monitors. The doctors say you were lucky. The beam mostly caught your shoulder. Over the next few weeks, John threw himself into physical therapy with the same determination he brought to firefighting. His sons organized their schedules to ensure one of them was always there to help with his exercises. During one particularly challenging session as Michael helped him with arm stretches, John shared stories from his early days as a firefighter. You know, your father, Mark and I started at the station together, he said, gritting his teeth through a difficult movement. We were terrified our first call, but we had each other's backs. Like we do now, Eli said quietly, watching from nearby. The physical therapist guided John through another set of exercises while Sam took notes already thinking about future home care. John noticed and smiled. You'd make a great doctor, son. You've got both the brains and the heart for it. During a water break, Michael asked the question they'd all been thinking about. Dad, after all this, are you sure you want to go back? John looked at each of his sons in turn. Being a firefighter isn't just what I do. It's who I am. Just like Eli's art, Sam's medicine, and your business dreams, Michael. Sometimes the things that matter most come with risks. But what if something worse happens next time? Eli's voice wavered slightly. John reached for his son's hand. That's always been part of the job. But it's worth it to me, knowing I might help another family like ours. Give someone else a second chance at family, just like we got. The boys exchanged glances, understanding in their eyes. They'd seen firsthand how John's courage had changed their lives and now they watched as he applied that same determination to his recovery. As weeks passed, John grew stronger. His sons worked alongside him, Sam ensuring proper form during exercises, Michael providing steady support during walking practice, and Eli documenting his progress through sketches that showed their father's gradual return to strength. Finally, the day came for John to return to work. 
he stood before his bedroom mirror, adjusting his freshly pressed uniform. His sons gathered in the doorway, their faces a mixture of pride and concern. Looking sharp, Dad, Michael said, helping John with his collar. Sam double-checked the medical clearance papers one last time. Everything's in order. Eli hung back slightly, then stepped forward with a small painting, a portrait of John in his uniform standing tall and strong. To hang in your locker, he said softly, so you remember we're always with you. John pulled his sons into a careful group hug, mindful of his healing shoulder. Together, they walked to the front door, ready for John's return to the job he loved. Twenty years had passed since that pivotal day when John Carter had returned to firefighting. Life had taken the Thompson brothers down different paths, yet their bond remained unshakable. Eli lived in a warm, sunlit suburban home where his artwork adorned every wall. His wife Sarah, an art teacher he'd met at one of his exhibitions, worked alongside him in their home studio. Their two children, Maya and Marcus, inherited their father's creative spirit, often joining him at the easel. In another part of town, Michael's landscaping business had grown from a one-man operation into Thompson Green Spaces, employing 30 people. He took special pride in hiring young people from challenging backgrounds, remembering his own journey. His office walls displayed photos of the parks, gardens, and community spaces his company had transformed. Sam had become one of the most respected cardiologists at Central Memorial Hospital. His colleagues admired not just his medical expertise, but his genuine compassion for patients. Pictures of his family, his wife Jessica and their three children, sat on his desk alongside his medical degrees and awards. Despite their busy lives, the brothers never let distance or responsibilities weaken their connection. Every Sunday evening, their faces would appear on screens for their weekly video chat. The kids won't stop talking about Uncle Michael's new playground design, Eli said during one call while Maya bounced excitedly in the background. Wait until they see the treehouse section, Michael grinned. Speaking of which, Sam, how did Tommy like the garden we installed at your place? Sam's face lit up. He practically lives out there now. Jessica says we should have named it Tommy's Territory. The brothers made it a priority to support each other's achievements. When Eli unveiled his latest collection at the Contemporary Art Center, Michael and Sam were there, proudly explaining the symbolism in their brother's work to other guests. When Michael's company won the contract for the city's new botanical garden project, his brothers helped organize the groundbreaking ceremony. And when Sam received an award for pioneering a new cardiac procedure, Eli and Michael sat in the front row cheering the loudest. Michael's success allowed him to create opportunities for others. He established a mentorship program guiding young entrepreneurs through the challenges of starting their own businesses. Someone gave me a chance, he often said, thinking of John. Now it's my turn to do the same. Sam's reputation at the hospital grew not just from his medical skills, but from his ability to connect with patients. He kept a special box of drawings from Eli in his office, sharing them with patients who needed encouragement during their recovery. Eli's art had evolved to capture the essence of family and community. His exhibitions became local events, drawing people together to celebrate not just art, but the connections between people. His most popular series, Bonds, featured paintings inspired by his brothers and their shared journey. As John's 60th birthday approached, the brothers coordinated their family's arrivals at their childhood home. Cars pulled into the familiar driveway one by one. Children spilled out, running to greet their cousins. Spouses carried dishes and gifts, exchanging warm hugs. John stood on the porch, his hair now silver but his smile as bright as ever, watching his family gather. The brothers approached together, each carrying a special gift, their faces reflecting the love and gratitude they felt for the man who had given them a second chance at family. The aroma of grilled burgers and hot dogs wafted through the backyard as John masterfully worked the barbecue, just as he had done countless times before. The familiar setting was alive with new energy, as grandchildren chased each other across the lawn where the Thompson brothers had once played. Maya, Eli's daughter, showed off her latest painting to her cousins while Tommy, Sam's youngest, demonstrated a cartwheel he'd perfected. The adults gathered around picnic tables laden with potato salad, coleslaw, and Jessica's famous apple pie. 
Just like old times, Michael said, helping John at the grill. Except now there's a lot more of us to feed. As evening approached, the family settled around the fire pit John had built years ago. The flames cast a warm glow on their faces as marshmallows roasted on long sticks. Eli pulled out his sketchbook, sharing his latest series inspired by their family history. This one, he explained, turning to a detailed sketch of their old bedroom, is from that first night we stayed here. Remember how John got us all those superhero blankets? Sam leaned forward, adjusting his glasses. I still have mine packed away somewhere. The Superman one, right? Michael chuckled, adding another log to the fire. Business has been crazy lately, but moments like this remind me why we work so hard. Last week, we finished a community garden project in the same neighborhood where we grew up. Speaking of work, Sam interjected, his face brightening. We've made real progress with that new cardiac procedure. Had a patient last week. Reminded me of Dad, actually. Stubborn as anything, but pulled through beautifully. John sat back in his chair, watching his sons share their stories. His eyes glistened in the firelight as he listened to the men they'd become. You know, he said during a quiet moment, I remember sitting right here with you boys that first summer trying to figure out how to be a family. Look at us now. Remember when you taught us to make s'mores? Eli asked, helping his youngest with a marshmallow. You said the secret was patience. That wasn't just about s'mores, was it, Dad? Michael smiled knowingly. Well, John replied with a wink, maybe I had a few life lessons wrapped up in there. The conversation flowed naturally between present and past, punctuated by laughter and the crackling of the fire. Stories of school days, first jobs, and family milestones wove together with tales of current achievements and future dreams. As the evening cooled, Sarah suggested taking a family photo. They gathered in front of the house, three generations standing together. John stood in the center, surrounded by his sons and their families. The camera captured genuine smiles, the kind that come from hearts full of love and gratitude. Everyone say Carter family, Sarah called out, holding up the camera. The group responded with enthusiastic shouts, their voices blending together just as their lives had over the years. The early morning sun had barely peeked over the horizon when the Thompson brothers quietly slipped into John's garage. Their breath created small clouds in the chilly air as they huddled around their secret project, a vintage fire truck that had taken months to restore. Michael circled the truck, running his expert hands along the engine components one final time. Everything's perfect mechanically. She purrs like a kitten now, he whispered, pride evident in his voice. Eli stood back examining the artistic details he'd added to the restoration. The truck's red paint gleamed like new, and along its sides he'd hand-painted delicate gold leaf designs incorporating symbols from John's firefighting career. Axes, ladders, and the station's original badge number. The testimonial video is ready, Sam said, checking his tablet. You wouldn't believe how many people wanted to share stories about Dad. Former colleagues, families he's helped, even that kid he rescued from the Miller House fire ten years ago. They worked quickly but carefully, transforming the garage into a celebration space. Sarah and Jessica, their wives, helped string up banners while the children placed balloons strategically around the truck. Michael's oldest daughter, Emma, carefully arranged chairs for the video presentation. Remember, Michael reminded everyone, when you hear mom's signal, that's when we bring dad out. The families gathered, excitement building as they heard Jessica's voice floating through the morning air, asking John to come outside. Sam held the blindfold ready, and their children giggled as they watched their grandfather being led carefully toward the garage. What's all this about? John asked, laughing as Sam secured the blindfold. Just a few more steps, Dad, Eli guided him gently. The garage door rolled up with a quiet rumble, and the brothers positioned John perfectly in front of their surprise. The morning sun caught the freshly polished chrome, making it sparkle. Ready? Michael asked, his voice thick with emotion. One, two, three. Sam removed the blindfold and John blinked in the morning light. For a moment, he stood completely still, taking in the sight before him. His eyes widened as he recognized the truck. Engine 17, his very first assignment as a rookie firefighter. Is that? He whispered, stepping forward slowly. 
His hand trembled as he reached out to touch the familiar chrome trim. How did you... We've been working on it for months, Michael explained, watching as his father ran his hand along the restored side panel. The original was about to be scrapped, Sam added. We couldn't let that happen. Eli stepped forward, pointing out the detailed artwork. See here? These are all the station numbers you worked at over the years. Tears welled in John's eyes as he circled the truck, taking in every detail. His fingers traced the gold leaf designs, lingering on the numbers and symbols that represented decades of service. Dad, Michael said, his voice steady despite the emotion in his eyes. This truck represents everything you've taught us about dedication, service, and love. Just like you restored our lives, we wanted to restore something precious to you. The joyful atmosphere shattered in an instant. One moment John was running his fingers along the restored fire truck's gleaming surface, tears of happiness in his eyes. The next, his face contorted in pain. His hand flew to his chest, clutching at his shirt as he stumbled backward. Dad? Michael's voice cracked with alarm. Before anyone could react, John's knees buckled. He collapsed onto the concrete floor of the garage, his body crumpling like a puppet with cut strings. Sam sprang into action, his medical training taking over. Call 911, he shouted, dropping to his knees beside his father. His fingers pressed against John's neck, checking his pulse while his other hand loosened John's collar. Eli pulled his children back as they started crying, while Michael quickly cleared space around John. The restored fire truck, moments ago the center of their celebration, now loomed silently over the scene. Stay with us, Dad. Sam muttered, his professional demeanor cracking slightly as he monitored John's vital signs. The ambulance is coming. The wail of sirens grew louder and within minutes EMTs rushed into the garage. Sam rattled off medical terms and vital signs, his voice steady despite the fear in his eyes. The EMTs worked quickly, attaching monitors and preparing John for transport. BP's dropping, one EMT announced. We need to move now. They lifted John onto the stretcher. His face was pale, his usually strong features now slack and vulnerable. The sight hit his sons hard. They'd never seen their father look so fragile. The drive to the hospital felt endless. Michael followed the ambulance in his car, with Eli and their families behind him. Sam rode in the ambulance, helping the EMTs monitor John's condition. At the hospital, the emergency room doors swung open automatically as the EMTs rushed John inside. Sam tried to follow, but a nurse gently stopped him. Dr. Carter, you know the rules, she said softly. Let us take care of him. The brothers gathered in the waiting room, the reality of the situation weighing heavily on them. Eli paced back and forth, his artist's hands fidgeting restlessly. Michael sat rigid in his chair, his jaw clenched tight. Sam stood by the window, his medical knowledge making the waiting even harder. He's always been so strong, Eli whispered, his voice breaking the tense silence. I never thought. None of us did, Michael replied, running his hands through his hair. He's dad. He's always been... Invincible, Sam finished, turning from the window. His medical coat was still in the ambulance, and without it, he looked less like a doctor and more like a scared son. But he's not. None of us are. The waiting room filled with their extended family, wives trying to comfort their husbands, children huddled together, speaking in whispers. The restored fire truck, meant to be a symbol of their father's strength and legacy, now stood abandoned in the garage, its celebration interrupted by this stark reminder of mortality. In the dimly lit hospital room, the steady beep of monitors provided a rhythmic backdrop to the brothers' vigil. Sam sat closest to John's bed, his medical training evident in the way he regularly checked the monitors and adjusted his father's blanket. Eli had set up his sketchbook on a small side table, his pencil moving across the paper as he captured the scene before him. Michael stood by the window, his usual confident stance replaced by worried tension. Remember when Dad taught us to swim? Eli broke the silence, his pencil pausing. I was so scared of the water, but he just stood there arms outstretched, promising he wouldn't let go. He never did, Michael added softly. Not just with swimming. Remember when I wanted to start the landscaping business? 
Everyone said it was too risky, but Dad sat down with me every night for weeks, helping me plan it out. Sam nodded, his eyes fixed on John's peaceful face. He did the same when I told him I wanted to be a doctor. Worked extra shifts to help pay for my prep courses. His voice caught slightly. Said he'd rather work himself to the bone than see us give up on our dreams. The brothers fell quiet as a nurse came in to check John's vitals. After she left, Eli set down his sketchbook and moved closer to the bed. You know what I remember most? He said. That first art show at school. I was so nervous about being the only black kid in the exhibition, but Dad showed up in his uniform, straight from his shift, covered in soot, stood there so proud, telling everyone who'd listen about my paintings. He taught us to face everything head on, Michael reflected. No running, no hiding. Remember what he always said? Courage isn't about not being scared, Sam quoted. It's about doing what's right even when you are scared. The brothers shared knowing looks, each remembering times when those words had guided them through difficult moments. He lived those words every day, Michael said. Running into burning buildings, raising three boys on his own, standing up to people who didn't think we belonged together. Sam reached out and took his father's hand. We need to be strong now, like he taught us. Whatever happens, we stick together. Eli moved to the other side of the bed, placing his hand over Sam's and John's. For Dad... Everything he taught us, everything he believed in. We keep that alive. Michael joined them, completing the circle. We promise, Dad, he said firmly. Your legacy lives on through us. The courage, the integrity, the love you showed us. We'll pass it all on to our own children. In that moment, surrounded by the soft glow of hospital monitors and the weight of their shared memories, the three brothers stood united in their silent pledge to honor the man who had given them not just a home, but a foundation for life itself. In the hushed darkness of the hospital room, John Carter lay awake, his mind drifting through the corridors of memory. The soft glow of medical equipment cast gentle shadows on the walls as he listened to the quiet hum of nighttime hospital activity beyond his door. His thoughts wandered to his first day at the fire station, young and eager polishing the bright red trucks until they gleamed. He remembered the weight of his first uniform, how it had felt both heavy and empowering. The face of his late wife, Sarah, emerged in his mind, her proud smile when he'd made lieutenant, her gentle encouragement through the tough calls. A small smile crossed his face as he recalled the day he'd signed the adoption papers. The boys had stood there, uncertain but hopeful, and he'd felt Sarah's presence so strongly then, almost as if she was nodding her approval. He could still picture Eli's first tentative smile, Sam's curious questions, and Michael's protective stance over his younger brothers. The memories flowed freely now, teaching the boys to ride bikes in the park, staying up late helping with science projects, attending art shows and academic competitions. Each moment had added another thread to the tapestry of their family life. He remembered the tough times too, the whispers at the grocery store the challenging parent-teacher conferences, the nights when the boys' nightmares about the fire would wake them all. John shifted slightly in his hospital bed, wincing at the twinge in his chest. His mind turned to the countless fires he'd fought, the lives he'd touched. Mrs. Henderson's cat rescued from a third-floor apartment. The Johnson twins carried out through thick smoke. Each save, each loss had shaped him, taught him something about life and courage. He thought about his sons now, Eli's sensitive artist soul, Sam's brilliant medical mind, Michael's entrepreneurial spirit. They'd taken the values he'd tried to instill, courage, compassion, integrity, and made them their own. Pride swelled in his chest as he remembered watching them overcome obstacles, stand up for each other, and grow into men of character. The first hints of dawn began to creep through his window. John felt a deep sense of contentment settle over him. His life hadn't gone according to plan, losing Sarah, adopting three boys, facing down community prejudice. But it had been rich with purpose and love. He could see his influence rippling outward through his sons, touching their families and community. As morning light painted the room in soft gold, John felt at peace. The steady beeping of monitors reminded him of his current fragility, 
but his heart was strong with the knowledge that his legacy lived on in the three remarkable men his sons had become. A few days later, after John got discharged from the hospital and was able to regain some of his strength, he was in for his next surprise. A crowd gathered outside a newly constructed building in the heart of town. John Carter sat in a wheelchair, his sons standing protectively around him as they approached the covered sign at the entrance. Though still recovering, his eyes sparkled with curiosity at the surprise his boys had promised him. Dad, close your eyes, Eli said softly, exchanging knowing looks with his brothers. The crowd hushed as Michael stepped forward, gripping the cord that would unveil the sign. Sam placed a gentle hand on John's shoulder, steadying him as anticipation built in the air. Open them, Michael called out. John's eyes widened as the cover fell away, revealing elegant letters spelling out John Carter Community Arts Center. For a moment, he sat perfectly still, taking in the magnitude of what his sons had created. Eli stepped forward his voice carrying across the gathered crowd. This center represents everything you taught us about community, creativity, and bringing people together. Every studio, every classroom, every gallery space was designed to foster the kind of understanding and unity you've always stood for. Michael guided John's wheelchair through the front doors, where the interior took everyone's breath away. Sunlight streamed through large windows, illuminating pristine white walls already adorned with local artwork. They passed fully equipped art studios, music rooms, and gathering spaces designed for community events. The center will offer free art classes for kids, Sam explained, gesturing to a bright classroom filled with easels. And there's a scholarship program for aspiring artists who can't afford supplies or education. As they toured the facility, John noticed thoughtful details everywhere. A mural depicting the town's history, including the fire station where he'd served for so many years a memorial wall honoring local heroes, and even a small museum section dedicated to the town's firefighting history. The tour concluded in the main gallery, where community members and local officials had gathered. Each of John's sons took turns speaking about their father's influence on their lives and the community. Their words painted a picture of a man who had not only saved lives as a firefighter, but had also changed lives through his compassion and courage. Tears welled in John's eyes as he listened to his sons share their vision for the center, how it would serve as a beacon of hope and creativity for generations to come. When they helped him to the podium, his hands trembled slightly as he gripped its edges, but his voice rang clear and strong. I never imagined, he began, looking out at the faces of friends, neighbors, and family, that my decision to open my heart and home to three remarkable boys would lead to something like this. This center, his voice caught with emotion as he gestured to the space around them. This is more than just a building. It's a testament to the power of love, family, and community. The crowd erupted in applause, many wiping away tears as they watched this proud father surrounded by his sons, living proof that family bonds transcend blood and that love can build bridges where none existed before. The atmosphere buzzed with excitement as hundreds of community members gathered under the freshly hung banner at the John Carter Community Arts Center. Children clutched colorful balloons while parents chatted eagerly, all eyes drawn to the gleaming new building that stood as a testament to creativity and community spirit. John sat in his wheelchair at the center of the ribbon-cutting ceremony, flanked by his three sons. His hands were steady as they gripped the large ceremonial scissors. Together, they cut the red ribbon, triggering a wave of applause and cheers from the crowd. Inside, the center came alive with performances. A local youth orchestra filled the main hall with classical music, their young faces beaming with concentration. In the dance studio, a troupe of dancers moved gracefully across the polished floors, their movements telling stories of hope and perseverance. Local poets took turns at the microphone in the intimate theater space, their words weaving tales of community strength and the impact of one firefighter's dedication to his town. Eli's artwork commanded attention in the main gallery, alongside pieces from other local artists. His latest series captured the essence of family and service, with one particularly striking painting showing three young boys being led from a burning house by a firefighter, a moment that had changed so many lives. This way, everyone, Michael called out, leading groups through the various spaces. 
He showed off the multimedia rooms equipped with the latest technology, while Sam explained the center's educational programs to interested parents. The tour continued through a peaceful sculpture garden, where wind chimes tinkled softly in the breeze. A special wing dedicated to firefighting history drew particular interest. Glass cases displayed vintage equipment, photographs, and newspaper clippings chronicling the department's history, with a special section honoring John's years of service. The mayor stepped up to the podium in the main hall, her voice carrying across the crowd. John Carter didn't just save lives as a firefighter, she said. He showed us what it means to build a true community. Other community leaders followed, each sharing stories of John's impact on the town. When Eli took the stage, his voice trembled slightly with emotion. This center represents everything our father taught us about the power of bringing people together, he said, gesturing to the space around them. Through art, through music, through dance and poetry, we can bridge divides and create understanding, just as he did throughout his life. As the day's festivities began to wind down, the crowd gathered for a toast. Glasses were raised high as John sat among his family, his eyes glistening as he took in the scene before him. A room full of people united in celebration of art, community, and the legacy of love he had helped create. The town hall's grand chamber buzzed with anticipation as residents filed in, filling every available seat. Sunlight streamed through tall windows, casting a warm glow over the polished wooden podiums and ceremonial flags. John Carter sat in the front row with his three sons, all dressed in their finest suits for this special occasion. Mayor Thompson stepped up to the microphone, her voice clear and strong. Today, we gather to honor a family that has become the very heartbeat of our community, she began. The Carter family has shown us what it means to rise above adversity and give back to others. One by one, community members approached the podium to share their stories. Mrs. Rodriguez, whose house John had saved from a devastating fire years ago, spoke through tears about his bravery. The owner of the local hardware store praised Michael's business ethics and his commitment to creating jobs for young people. A former patient of Sam's described how his innovative cardiac treatment had saved her life. The director of the local school board shared how Eli's art programs had transformed students' lives. The mayor returned to present a beautifully crafted bronze plaque to John. For 30 years of unwavering service, she read, protecting our community as a firefighter, mentor, and friend. The plaque gleamed under the lights, detailing dates and achievements that marked John's distinguished career. Michael received his award for business leadership and community development. Sam's Medical Service Award acknowledged his groundbreaking work at the hospital and his free clinic initiatives. Eli's contribution to the arts earned him recognition for transforming the cultural landscape of their town. When John rose to speak, the room fell silent. His voice, though softer than in his firefighting days, carried the same strength and sincerity that had guided three young boys to become remarkable men. Looking at my sons today, John said, gesturing to Michael, Sam, and Eli, I see not just their individual achievements, but the power of love and determination. These boys taught me as much about courage as I ever taught them. He paused, collecting himself. To this community who embraced us and supported us through every challenge, thank you. You've shown that family isn't just about blood. It's about the bonds we choose to forge and strengthen every day. The entire assembly rose to their feet, applause thundering through the chamber. The Carter family stood together, their journey from tragedy to triumph reflected in the tears and smiles of those around them. The next morning, John and his sons gathered around the well-worn breakfast table in their kitchen. Steam rose from their coffee cups while the familiar scent of pancakes filled the air. John cleared his throat, his hands wrapped around his mug. Boys, I've been doing some thinking, he began, his voice steady but gentle. After everything that's happened, I believe it's time for me to step back from active firefighting duty. The brothers exchanged glances, concern and understanding crossing their faces. Sam leaned forward, his doctor's instinct showing. How are you feeling about this, Dad? John smiled, the wrinkles around his eyes deepening. At peace, actually. Chief Roberts has been grooming young Thompson to take over my position, and I trust him completely. It feels right. What are you planning to do? Michael asked, passing the syrup to Eli. Well, John said, straightening in his chair. 
I've been talking with the department about setting up a mentorship program for new recruits. Share some of that old-timer wisdom. He chuckled. And I'd like to volunteer at the Arts Center. Maybe help with the youth programs. Eli's face brightened. The kids would love that, Dad. We've got a whole section dedicated to first responders' stories. I've also been thinking about writing down my experiences, John continued, his eyes distant with memory. All these years of service, the lives touched, the lessons learned, maybe it could help others understand what this life is really about. And travel, Sam prompted, remembering their previous conversations. That too, John nodded. There's so much I want to see with you boys, places your mother and I always talked about visiting. The conversation flowed naturally filled with suggestions and shared dreams. Michael mentioned coastal towns they could explore, while Sam spoke of historical sites he'd always wanted to show their father. You know, John said, his voice growing softer. Watching each of you find your path, seeing how you've grown, it makes this transition easier. You've all carried forward the values of service and compassion in your own ways. We learned from the best, Michael replied, his voice thick with emotion. The fire department will always be part of who we are, Sam added, but maybe it's time for you to enjoy life at a different pace. Eli reached across the table, squeezing his father's hand. We'll make sure your legacy continues, Dad. Through the art center, through Michael's business ethics, through Sam's healing work. John looked at each of his sons in turn, pride evident in his eyes. I know you will. You already do, every single day. The John Carter Community Arts Center buzzed with life as family members from across the country filled its halls. Sunlight streamed through the large windows, highlighting the colorful artwork that adorned the walls. Children's laughter echoed from the workshop area, where Eli's oldest daughter taught younger cousins how to mix watercolors. In the main gallery, Michael's teenage sons helped arrange chairs for the upcoming performances, while Sam's children distributed programs to arriving guests. The atmosphere was warm and festive, with the scent of coffee and fresh-baked cookies wafting from the center's cafe. Look at this place, John said to his sister-in-law, Sarah, who had flown in from Seattle. Who would have thought that old warehouse would turn into something so beautiful? The center's walls displayed a new collection of artwork, including pieces from local artists and students. A special section showcased photographs documenting the building's transformation alongside portraits of community members whose lives had been touched by the center's programs. The main event began with a local youth orchestra performing a piece specially composed for the occasion. Dance groups took turns on the stage, their movements telling stories of hope and community. In between performances, a short documentary played on the large screen, showing John's journey from firefighter to community pillar. That's your grandpa when he was younger whispered a mother to her child as footage of John's early firefighting days appeared on screen. The children's art workshop area remained active throughout the day, with little ones proudly showing off their creations to parents and grandparents. Eli moved between groups, offering gentle guidance and encouragement, just as John had done for him years ago. As evening approached, John stood at the podium, his sons nearby. His voice was strong and clear as he addressed the gathered crowd. Looking around this room, I see more than just an art center, he began. I see the heart of our community. I see children discovering their talents, just like Eli did with his first paintbrush. I see people coming together, supporting each other, growing together. He paused, his eyes moving across the familiar faces. This center represents everything I've always believed in, the power of family, the importance of nurturing creativity, and the strength of community. My sons have taken these values and built something remarkable. As the sun began to set, casting warm golden light through the windows, the entire family gathered on the center's front steps. John stood proudly in the middle, Eli, Michael, and Sam beside him, surrounded by grandchildren, in-laws, and extended family members. Everyone squeeze in closer, called the photographer. That's perfect. The camera captured the moment. Four generations of the Carter family standing together before the building that bore John's name, their smiles reflecting the joy and love that had brought them to this point. If you enjoyed the story of John, I handpicked this next story that you will enjoy. Please don't miss this one. Click here to watch it.